this is just um, in, in, in retrospect, this might have come up better before Nick could talk because he showed us really some of the very sophisticated um, developments, modern recent developments in, in magic. Um, but this is more of a, an outline of how magic has evolved over the past few years or and is continuing to evolve. Um, and um, for those of you who haven't seen it before, Is and what we're doing in terms of community development. Uh, so the need for magic really um, evolved uh, quite some time ago when it became apparent that existing databases were uh, limited in their capacity for uh, divulging what was going on with all the data. They've all been designed for very specific tasks and so the ability to look for example at full vector data was difficult when data were separately archived in the density data in whole databases, in paleosexual variation databases. So um, we at Scripps actually motivated very strongly by Hubert Staudigal, who isn't here, but hopefully will be around tomorrow evening for those of you who are sticking around, uh, began with a proposal to NSF for a workshop at SIO to uh, kind of bring a bunch of databases together and build into them the flexibility to go back and look at um, data that had been collected for a whole variety of purposes in different contexts. Um, and we were driven in doing that by a series of six scientific grand challenges, um, which I'll list on the next page. You're talking about one of those things today. today. Um, and the idea was to maintain an open archive that anybody could access for published rock and paleomagnetic data. And uh, here you are, you see the buzzwords. We were supporting transformative science by standardizing diverse data sets. Um, and uh, you've been hearing about uh, some of the uh, uh, need for standardization today and the ability for everybody to be able to look at each other's data in whatever detail they feel like. So um, here are the six grand challenges or themes that we put into our work and you'll see that uh, many of them are not being discussed today. Maybe there'll be topics for future workshops. Some of them will be discussed in some a little bit tomorrow. Um, but there's a lot of um, a, a lot of things that can be done with magnetic data that uh, we thought ought to be facilitated. Um, and today we're going to talk about the geomagnetic thermal history of the Earth, of course. So here are some of the complications we saw with data sets. Um, there are still a lot of paleomagnetic data that are lurking out there in old notebooks, in old digital media or offline. Uh, some of you have them in your repositories. And we hope to winkle them out of you sooner or later. Uh, before you carry them to your graves uh, or whatever you do yeah. with them. <laughs> uh, uh, so the idea here really is to um, enhance transparency and reproducibility. Um, we've heard a lot in the press about the need for reproducibility in science. Um, it goes along with uh, fake news. Uh, there's fake data and uh, we try to uh, avoid all of that. Uh, we really want this to be possible. We need the measurements in the database in order to be able to uh, assess what they really say. Um, there are also issues of maintenance. There are lots of um, data sets that have um, sort of worked their way through time, uh, gradually being updated. Sometimes when they're updated, data get duplicated and things haven't been versioned and we don't know what's gone into those data sets. So part of what we're trying to do here is to enable people to um, make sure they have the right collection of observations when they're making interpretations of them. Uh, and then there is the issue of accessibility that um, there were really um, a lot of existing databases that didn't have deep, deep search capabilities in understanding the metadata that was supporting the observations. And uh, some of these things had to do with things like in the poll database, which has been a wonderful database from the perspective of uh, making progress and having complete, relatively complete records of what people are doing. But there are issues about being able to update uh, incoming ages, new ages, how do we incorporate those in, how do we version things and make sure that people um, are using uh, not only the, uh, the most uh, accurate and modern data that are accessible, but also make sure that everybody's talking about the same data sets when they're talking about the interpretations. So um, MAGIC is um, a sample-based database. We use sample-based measurements uh, in paleomagnetism. We collect those during field work or sometimes people make synthetic samples in the lab. Um, these samples are then have measurements made on them in the lab. 
the interpretations are made, the interpretations are published in a journal, and by definition, we are samples-based measurements database. Uh, so uh, this may seem obvious to everybody in this room. It's not necessarily obvious to everybody in the data community where uh, one person's data looks a lot like somebody else's model. And um, we uh, need to make these distinctions so that we can understand the origin of what we're dealing with. Uh, for example, we heard um, pattern 2 m used earlier today. That's actually a model of what the axial dipole moment variations look like over the past couple of million years. It's based on observations, but it's actually an interpretation of those observations. Um, so every study uses different methods and reports results differently. We're a creative group. Everybody has their own lab method and their own way of interpreting things. Sometimes we call by the same name different things. And... Um, one of the challenges that we have in magnetics is to collect data together and standardize them in a way so that we can understand when we've done the same things or when we've done something different. Um, and um, the idea of magic is that we should do that there, that there should be uh, the ability to describe in as much detail as you choose to um, what your observations are. And uh, so without magic, we say this is a long and error prone process. You could say that with magic, it's a long and error prone process given that we've been working on it now for 15 years. So what we do is we use um, a single data model. Uh, you may note that uh, we'll, we want, with, by using this data model, we mean that the description is comprehensible to people who are putting data into the database. And so that disparate data, disparate data sets can be compared. You can combine them. Nick showed some great examples of those using the PMAGPI software. You can search for something. You can integrate it into your data stream, uh, work on it, download it. Um, with measurement data, you can reproduce the interpretation, uh, the interpretation and uh, decide whether you it get, would get the same result using your criteria as somebody else got. Uh, one of the things that is really, I think, critical for us all to appreciate is that um, papers of the future, as they're called in the, in the data world, are going to require this. Uh, we're already seeing in journals that um, when we publish things, we are asked to supply, uh, provide people with access to the original data and observations. Um, we're asked to supply uh, access, in some cases, to the interpretive code, to what we ran on them, so that other people can go back and redo things or reincorporate them into their observations. And that's part of uh, living with the internet and the ability to be online. So uh, this is an, actually the example of paleomagnetic data interpretation. Um, that I was asked to talk about at AGU in an informatics session where we were discussing um, the need for reproducibility in data. And I'm using here the example of a paper that uh, Lisa is the first author on, the senior author on, based on PMAGPI, uh, which it talks about how to use the software package PMAGPI that Nick was demonstrating so nicely in his Jupyter notebooks for paleomagnetic data analysis. Um, and uh, this is the kind of uh, reproducibility that is going to be expected of us in the future, that we, uh, first of all, we have a reference for where we're going. That's easy within, paleo within magic. Uh, secondly, that we have a data archive that we know what version number we've archived something under. This was under 2.5. We're now moving to 3.0, as most of you know, as of this week. Um, been working on that for quite a while. You say where you can find the data set, you give a URL, you talk about the data interpretation and what software was used for the data interpretation, and you say what version of software was used for that, um, and you see here that it's all open source, and the idea here is that this should be a community-driven effort where there's room for variability in how we interpret things, and even in how we archive things, but you have to say what it is that you've done. So... Um, there's been some recent progress in MAGIC. Uh, many of you uh, uh, realized, realized, as we did, that the original data model was enormously complicated. It had something of the order of 25 data tables for various kinds of pieces of information. Not all of them had to be completed. Uh, many people said, why can't I just put in a data table? And um, we listened. And uh, now the data model is significantly simplified, and there is, under MAGIC GUI, now the opportunity to Put, which you'll, those of you who are here on Thursday will hear much more about and have the opportunity to play with, how to put data into the database in a much simplified form. 
there's an opportunity. You can still uh, put in a great deal of information, but if, for those people who want to put in very basic information, the process has been greatly simplified. Uh, so there are some other things in here. One of the things that we have, we are interested in being um, the data being accessible to other folks in other disciplines. So MAGIC is now listed in the Registry of Research Data Repositories, RE3 data. Uh, Science Direct has banners to MAGIC, which are live. Uh, we can mint DOIs. Uh, I like to call them DOIs, but everybody thinks that's funny for some reason. <laughs> um, and we can mint those for data sets or for documents that describe the data. So one of the things that um, we know is that, you, you probably know, is that in MAGIC we have a record of a project or a publication. So the uh, record of a particular data set, unlike, for example, in, um, in the uh, poll database or something like that, if there is a publication associated with the data, then those two things are linked. And um, that is how, we will, how you can recover those observations is through understanding where it was published and to know what data formed the basis for that particular publication. So these are some things that we've done recently. There are also some imminent plans. The technology stack, I should, this should say, has been modernized. Um, we are, uh, will be in nature repositories. We're building an API to support federated searches so that um, our data can be found from other databases. Um, for example, if you're interested in knowing about pole paths or reconstruction and you're working with G plates, for other dynamic reconstructions, we would like you to be able, people to be able to find the observations that are in MAGIC. And um, we are continuing to try and engage a broader and broader community to work with this um, database. Um, that's part of what this workshop is about. So, uh, talking a little bit about the technology, um, Rupert is going to demonstrate some of this tomorrow, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But the idea is to work with open source reusable software. Um, we saw some of that in the fact that Lisa was um, uh, impelled to turn over the keys of PMAGPI and allow other people to uh, take the data, the data source out, the program source out, and work on it, um, as you saw in this great examples that Nick had. Um, and the idea is to have reasonable software so that the community can contribute to the development of the software where they see a need for things that are not available to them already. Okay. So um, some various things have changed since our last workshop when we were still using um, an <coughs> Oracle database. Now it's a package in the EarthRef Meteor application. Um, PMAGPI, which you heard some examples from, is an analysis tool, and it's a way of working within MAGIC. It's a way, a mechanism for producing data that could be archived into MAGIC using that software tool. Um, it's also a mechanism that one can use to work to draw data out of MAGIC and to reinterpret the data if one so chooses. Um, these data are the MAGIC and PMAGPI software are basically now openly available on GitHub and um, as Nick described you can actually fork the data, fork the software, the software, take it out, work on it, ask to resubmit it as, an, as a different, um, as, a, as an upgrade to the system or an augmentation to the system. And that is something that we would like to encourage. So uh, I already said this, so I won't say it again. With this, the new data model that we work with now is version 3.0. It has a lot fewer tables and columns, so it's a lot easier to digest. Um, and it has grouped columns so that one can hide things one doesn't want to use. And um, some of you in this room uh, reviewed and improved it when we first put out a beta test of it. And thank you for that input. OK, so um, there are some web application examples which Rupert will talk about tomorrow. These basically uh, involve a data model browser where one can upload in an Excel-like sheet online. And um, I'm not going to say any more about it than that. There is also a contribution upgrader that converts data sets in older versions to model 3.0, so that those of you who already contributed didn't waste your effort. Um, and uh, this uh, is, everything is working um, considerably faster than it used to do so. So I'll just say a few words actually about the workflow for MAGIC. This is a, a graphic that comes from the, uh, paper that was published in GCube last year. 
Um, the basic idea that we have is that um, you should be able to collect samples, prepare your specimens, make laboratory measurements, put all these into some software system. Here, the example is PMAGPI software, um, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and then there should be a mechanism for uploading into the MAGIC database, make plots, whatever, discover other contributions, compile new data sets, re-download them, do whatever you want to prepare your data for publication. And um, the examples that Nick showed actually in some ways reflect the way that the publication industry is evolving, where they see the idea being that uh, maybe in the future we won't be writing papers as we see them conventionally, people will be submitting Jupyter notebooks and you'll just be uh, working online and everybody will be able to go out and verify your calculations using whatever software you did on the web. So I don't think we're going to be there for quite some time yet, but there is certainly a view that uh, the earth science paper of the future will look quite different from the thing that uh, some of us grew up with. Okay, so this shows the workflow. Here's the field and the laboratory. Here's Lisa with her scribe out. Is it a scribe? It looks like she's scribing a rock. The, the specimens, uh, the PMAG GUI interface then comes to for converting measurement data into magic data format, uh, prepare a contribution, unpacking downloaded data sets. Um, the PMAG PI software, um, actually allows you to do the interpretation within that software if you choose to. Um, and then this goes into an archive in the MAGIC database and um, Nick was brave enough to do these searches in real time and I'm very glad that it was him and not me. Because <laughs> I'm not good on the real time searches. Okay, so then uh, this is actually a figure from that paper that shows the results of reanalysis of data um, and this just shows some of the differences um, uh, using different criteria um, for assessing paleo intensity data. Uh, we know that uh, we, Nick also had some great examples of this, of how if we reinterpret the data using different criteria, there will be different, different answers. And as more data are assembled into the database, we can hope that those different solutions will actually inform us a lot about what we need to know in terms of um, developing knowledge about the magnetic field. Uh, one of the things of, of, about doing paleomagnetism is that all of the data are hard won. It's a lot of work. Uh, John showed this morning the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the track from picking zircons down to uh, successful observations. Uh, we don't want to throw away any of that information, even if it goes back to times where the uh, lab methods and the criteria for selection were different. But we do want to be able to go back and say, what if I used a different criterion in this selection? How would I end up reinterpreting this? And I think that's a very important point that we want to get across with this um, database development. Okay, so um, just to say a few minute words about uh, magic in the community at large. Um, as I said, we there's a new data model out that has um, remind me is it seven or nine tables having a I can nine. Never, nine thank you I never remember numbers I'd be richer if I could <laughs> <laughs> so model 3.0 makes it a lot easier to contribute especially with large contributions it's faster simpler and um, we'll see some demonstrations of it later on there are now um, quite a lot of measurements in the database. Uh, close to 5 million, um, up from order 2 million three years ago. A uh, lot of contributions in terms of uh, numbers of papers, over 4,000 papers, and they cover 161,000 paleomagnetic sites worldwide. So that's a lot of information. Uh, there are surely mistakes in the way that some of us have put these data into the system. Um, if you're using it, let us know so that we can fix them. Or you can fix them, either way. <laughs> Lisa will tell you how. <laughs> okay. uh, and uh, we are actively identifying newly published papers suited for magic. If you get an email from us saying we like your paper, please archive it. Please do. Um, and uh, the other thing that you will see is that uh, the use of Meteor and MongoDB, this, these new software and uh, web-based uh, searches are making magic much more responsive. So. Uh, thinking about a broader scope than um, we have uh, is, is something that we think is important. This basically shows you uh, 
the, the data are well distributed. There's a lot of continental and oceanic data in here. These are the sites on the left side um, so in MAGIC. And then on the right side, you see the number of those sites that actually have measurements associated with them. So those are 11% of the total. Um, there's clearly a lot more we could do in terms of getting measurements into the database and um, that's where we uh, look for some help and we hope that we can help you with that as well by making, continuing to make the database a little more user-friendly and accessible. There's an issue of data rescue which I mentioned earlier. There are a lot of magnetic labs um, that are currently in transition or closing because of imminent principal investigator retirement, um, or maybe not quite imminent. Some of the people continue to be active, but um, none of us are immortal. Um, I've got a list of names here, and I hope I'm not offending anybody by putting it up here, but these are folks who've been community leaders who have collected tons of measurement data. And we want to capture these data before they go away. Some of them probably the measurement data have already gone away because of being on inaccessible digital formats. Um, but if they are at all retrievable, we're certainly interested in doing that. And there's an example of this. Um, Shelby uh, over there has been um, digging around in uh, New Mexico, getting old archives of archaeological records and these are, this is not a pleasant task. <laughs> she will tell you the stories of how difficult it is to resurrect stuff that's been sitting out in somebody's garden shed for years. Um, so we don't want to be in this business. Um, and the, in fact, there's no need to be in this business any longer because uh, we are now in the digital age where everybody should be collecting the data digitally and archiving it um, as they collect it. Okay, so here are some collaborations with other initiatives that um, some of them are still in, in the nascent stage, some of them we're seriously interested in developing. Uh, some of these things are outlined in purple. These are um, databases we've been working with um, since more or less since the inception of MAGIC. These are a collection of databases uh, involving paleosecular variation records from LAVAs, GPMDB, which is the poll database, Dragon is its online implementation. A uh, bunch of these things in purple were things that were sponsored by um, IAGA, the International Association of Geomagnetism and Neuronomy. Um, we have tried to integrate those things together so that the data are accessible um, from a variety of different perspectives, depending on what you want to use them for. Um, there are other folks, some many represented in this room, who are working on other kinds of interfaces and databases. And um, the goal is to... Um, Firstly, uh, make sure that we have a common understanding of what we think are the important things to know about the data that are being archived. And secondly, to facilitate communication between MAGIC, which is a uh, sample-based database based on publications, and some of these other databases where the uh, specific interest is particular kinds of results. But we would like people to be able to go from those databases into MAGIC so that we can actually um, allow people to look in more detail um, at some of the results that they might be using from those specific targeted databases. And I see in here that we've missed um, EPOS. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> we'll add it next time. We'll add it on. Okay. Uh, so here's the broader scope. We know that um, the the data that we collect is useful for all sorts of things. Here are some of the things that it's used for, for history, archaeology, geochronology, all sorts of solar terrestrial studies, geomagnetism. And um, in the future, we can see that uh, some of it will be broadening out to some of those other themes that um, I mentioned before. And these will basically involve, in fact, already we are intrinsically involved in this through the uh, verification and, and of the uh, reliability of data in looking at multi-scale problems so that we understand the basics of how the mag magnetic signal is recorded all the way from um, domains to, um, to other planets. Okay, so um, I apologize for not being Anthony. And <laughs> if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them or refer them out to the rest of the room.
там файлы.